I know that you'd like to uh, let as many younger players or current players as possible know um, about how the NFL handles retired players. Uh, what are your feelings on, you know, the, the about the NFL and their treatment of retired players? Well, I, I, it's a travesty. It's a travesty, you know. And, but I also feel that the players are responsible for 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 being letting it happen the way that it happened. And it's really the NFL has, you know. It, it, it provides an opportunity for all in the sporting football business. But our union, or the NFLPA, has really been a disservice to us. And most players, because I remember days the NFLPA would come in, guys leave, don't even go into the meeting to get the information, and they would be talking about benefits in the future and all those things. So in some of what has created that problem is that the NFL PA understands the cycle of players. They know that by the time a player would get an issue, table the issue, and it take root in the league, one, they're going to stymie it and block it enough to where you can't get in momentum, but because you're in and out of the league so quick that the history doesn't stay. So I might have the knowledge of things that are wrong with the system, but before I could actually go through the bylaws, get it tabled, have the people that's created the problem removed to fix it, I will be out of the out of the game. That's just works to the detriment of the players. As a player, I can name some specific things that were done and that are still today being done to players. As an example, the Reggie White settlement. The, I remember I was a, a player rep. And during, when Reggie was about to sign that, I told Reggie not to sign it because he was signing away the player's ability of being able to take their goodwill, intellectual property, and their likeness and be able to earn for themselves revenue. The NFL and the NFLPA and Norman Brayman, who was the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, filed a – deposition as an objector to the settlement for the Reggie White settlement. And here's two of the main reasons he did. Out of the Reggie White settlement, he's the only owner that lost players to free agency. Reggie and Keith Jackson, no other team lost any players. Under the gentleman agreement supposedly they had amongst the owners, that no owner was going to bid on any other owner's players. They broke that. He then started divulging the things that purportedly being the president of NFL properties, which was the NFL's licensing arm that started signing players directly to contracts that would allow us to get the revenue paid directly to us that an endorser, or someone that would want to produce the player in a promotion, the money came directly to us. In the global agreement, he, being Norman Brayman, said that he negotiated to pay the players associ player association a hundred million under the table, and they would give up the rights of being able to bring deals or licensing opportunities to players. So they were going to get out of the players' business. Now, why that's significant to me, which I don't think anyone has ever really challenged it, is that here's an owner that's following a federal deposition of an objection, and he put in the document that he did that, what owner would purge themselves? And what happened in that process, it went before Judge Doty. And before I was an objector, and it was about 21 other objectors there. 
And before we could ever get in the room, Judge Doty brought Brayman in, told Brayman that he had agreed to the agreement and that he was going to have to live by it and dismissed it and threw it out before any of the rest of us were able to even use his deposition as a premise of why this should go forward. Separated the process. Okay? Now, the second piece of it is that as being a player rep, we had never, ever seen that document, ever, when we were talking about the executive decisions that had to be made about the settlement. But here's how the document came to the table. I found it, and this is how I found it. Ralph Wilson, the owner of the Buffalo Bills, and I were represented by the same law firm named Dyke McGossett. Dyke McGossett in Detroit, Michigan, was the largest law firm in the state of Michigan. Dyke McGossett was the law firm that represented my licensed company, which I was the only player in the history of pro football or any sports to own 100% of a licensed business. I was a partner with the owners. I made merchandise and sold licenses and used player likenesses. So the law firm is representing me and they're representing the owner, but I'm an objector and he's the defender. So anytime you have that under the etiquette of law, you exchange files. My lawyer get all his files. This lawyer get all my files. That's how I found it. And when I brought it back to other guys that were on the executive committee, all of a sudden each one of these guys started getting deals, little side deals with the PA. And it still exists because that was their way of somewhat quieting what happened and then turn back around and say, Jerry Ball is crazy and what I'm saying isn't true. But I didn't create the document. I was smart enough to have Dyke McGossett as the law firm representing my licensed company, which had absolutely nothing to do with the settlement until I became the objector. And when I became an objector, then we're exchanging the information, and you could see. But if you were to look at the things over the years, even on the Philly.com, you can – go and see Norman Brayman's response, and Norman Brayman didn't sue the other owners. He sued the NFLPA, and the NFLPA's response was is that it was ludicrous. How ludicrous is it for a billionaire to purge themselves? Why would you be a billionaire and want to give up your freedom? By saying you did it, not that we did it as a group, that I negotiated it. So in that, there has always been this undercurrent of issue. If you look at the NFL PA right now, the thing that their bylaws used to say, and they cleaned it up because I brought it to the attention of some of the guys that are on the retired board that are now on the national NFL PA board for active and retired players, they've weaseled their way up into that structure but I raised this issue with them. I said, how are we a 5016 as an organization? Retired chapters are 501 C6s, which is like a chamber of commerce, and the NFL PA in D.C. is a 501 C3. How does that, those bylaws decide what's going on over here with a C6? And then they start going back and trying to clean that up because it's like uh, it's a thought with the retired player that they can go back to the NFL PA and get the same access that they did as an active player because they're paying union dues, which they just canceled, to whereas now everybody can get, become a part of the union for free. Why is that? Because here we are paying union dues to something that is not a union, but you're doing it through a chamber of commerce. So there are all kind of antitrust laws that are being broke. There are all kind of 
things like enrollment, and enrollment means is where one guy that's a member or the president of, let's say, the chamber cannot benefit more than other members. Well, there's guys that are president of the retired chapters that are also representing players with concussion or workman's stump that are former players that are also on the board of the national at the national level, but they get they benefit, but there's no benefit to the player. So when you start looking at all of the things that we're entitled to, whether or not we're part of the retired chapter or not does not default the fact that our retirements, our benefits, and these things still belong to us. And because the NFLPA is in partnership with the owners, that's who manages the funds and the decisions. And it's probably the greatest travesty for all players, specifically in the linemen and those that have passed. When you look at the benefits, and the time that the benefits become available to the players is at the same time that the players are dying off. If you Google and see what the average lifespan of a defensive lineman and an offensive lineman in, is in the NFL, it's 55 and 58. Yeah, Our retirement starts years at 55. shorter than a normal person. Excuse me? Yeah. And, I mean, what, yeah. what do you think of the NFL's concussion settlement? Well, the, the concussion part, you know, I will tell you, you know, I had, have not today chosen an attorney, hadn't went to be a part of the suit, because quite honestly, um, I understand that it's a potential for money, but to actually get the money they're talking about, <laughs> I don't want that ailment. I don't want to be um, in that state you know, but if I'm do it, I think that you should make it available to me while I'm alive. Okay, and I don't think that you know the organization being the game, the league, be it owner side or player side, has done enough. I remember one conversation I had with the benefits office there in Baltimore. I was trying to do my in line of duty. And I just missed the window less than 30 days. Now, I played 13 years, but in 30 days, you tell me that I missed the window for following that, but it's on some it's misinformation that a guy tells me. But the guy makes one comment to me. His name is Sam Vincent, and I never forget it. If I ever have a chance to see him face-to-face, I'm going to let him know some things about himself. He makes the statement that, well, it's not like you're policeman. Okay, now this is the guy that's handling our benefits that's comparing what we're doing to policemen so that he's taking a risk management assessment of saying, well, it's not like this. But then when this CTE comes out, I want to ask him, no, we're not policemen, but who else is facing this? Because these benefits is the same risk that all players have paid have played under that same risk without this knowledge of truly the traumatic episodes that happen with players as they progress and move on. A lot of times it's mixed diagnosed, you know, some of the mental illnesses and depression and the way guys or faculties are, you know, it always gets thrown, oh, he's crazy, he's this. It's always in a dismissive fashion, but no one steps up to really understand that that game could have been the chief culprit and why that player functions like that because no one has ever talked about CTE until this come up in the last three years. You know? Yeah, and, and I was, and The thing that's so, amazing to me real quick, Jerry, is, is the fact that these guys, a lot of them, can't walk and they can't even get disability. Man, I have my own problems. I have a chop block, and right now every my my knee, I, I I walk every step in pain. I got nerve damages, you know, and and I can tell you, you know, what we're really talking about is quality of life. Yeah. The NFL right. and the things that you know, Gene Upshaw decided. Gene Upshaw, you know, again, yeah. <laughs> 
Look, every when Gene was alive, every time he walked in that room, he and I was always about to get in the battle, you know, because I would call him out on certain things. You know, I remember one time when we were, they had had recertified and was passing the Reggie Wright settlement. So Gene comes into Cleveland. Just so happened I had just left Detroit being the player rep there. So it's now I'm the player rep leaving Detroit. Now I'm in Cleveland, but it's still in the same cycle. So there hasn't been any re-elections, so I'm still getting all the data. So Gene comes in. He says, yes, 51% of the players that voted voted for it. And everyone in the locker room, we knew that the majority of our team did not vote because everybody asked, did you vote, did you vote? So we took a head count that day. And that head count meant that only 13 players voted. So you're saying seven voted on the team with 55, and y'all passed that? But here's one of the other things that they did, that no, only very few of us caught this. When they sent out the announcement for telling players that they had so much time to respond back and either say yay or nay or remain abstain from the vote, they had sent us a letter out that inside the letter, it had a date of March 25th, okay? And in that letter, it said that we had to respond by April 1st. But the postmark on the on the envelope said all the seconds. So here's a letter that on the inside says you have to respond to, but the postmark on the outside said April second, which is the day after the day they said you had to respond. That's the type of game that our player association has been playing with us. Here's another thing that, and here's one of the solutions I think. First of all, we need to go through and look. Everyone that was a part of that Reggie Wright settlement, I'm talking about from the attorneys on down, and we need to look to remove them. And we need to ask them for job descriptions of the jobs that they're doing because here's what's happening. Here you have labor issues that come up every so many years, but all of the changes that take place always happens in between. But more importantly, the revenue that's going into this one organization that D. Maurice Smith is the chairman of is the thing he does the least of. But that's where all his money comes from. And you know where it is? That's where all of the revenue comes in for the likenesses of the players. Most players don't understand that if it's eight or more players in a program, they don't have to pay the individual player. So let's say Frito Leia Pitsy comes to the NFL PA and say, hey, we want to get some players for a program, but we only want one in each market. Well, they sell it as a national campaign and use all 32 cities, and because it's 32 individual players, that exceeds the amount that they would be required to play the individual. So all that revenue for that goes into the NFL PA. And then from that money, the salaries are being paid to DeMaurice, Clark Gaines, um, the Will Gosher girl, who, whose family was the Gosher firm, that represented us, which is another crazy thing that happened during the time I'm a player rep. You know, we're sitting in in Maui, which we should be having it on mainland, but the reason why they have it on Maui is because they don't want the players to really come and participate because it's too hard to get families to Maui to go over there and voice your opinion. But here's what happens there. Well, Gossip comes and tells us that we have a bill for $8 million, but they hadn't done any new filings and there hadn't been any proceedings in a 12-month period of time, but our bill goes up to $8 million. Four months later, the NFL tells Well Gossip that we will settle this suit and pay y'all bill. <laughs> we didn't pay that law bill, that legal bill from the Red and White Settlement. The league paid it. So why would no law firm being said? But here's the most travesty, the thing that really shows and reflects that there's an issue that needs to be addressed and go deeper with players. Is well, gosh, is the same law firm was, that was representing Major League Baseball and Basketball. One of the two, I think, is baseball. But <laughs> they didn't get the jacked-up deal. 
<laughs> but when you talk to Major League Baseball and basketball players from then to now, the first thing they say is, man, we ain't never doing a deal like y'all union did. Man, y'all got a bad deal. Now, how do the basketball and the baseball and hockey players know football players got a bad deal, but the football players hadn't recognized where that bad deal was created? It was created within our own house. The owners control our union. They're in partnership. And television and media really is not going to be the ones that break this because that's their partner. Why would we lob a bomb on something that's already great for us? We got great advertising. We got the number one ratings. We got the top products in sports. Why would we blow that up? They're not. But that's just some things we need to do as players and taking care of our business that we don't. And part of it is removing leadership and taking the more recent. If he wants to represent the player, stay on the labor relations side. Get out of the licensing business because that's not you, what you was hired for. He said, oh, I was hired to represent players. But really, are you negotiating with Frito-Lay or Pepsi or any of that for any of the likeness use of the players? You're not. But you're getting the revenue that comes through that way. That's how you're getting paid the type of money you're getting paid. So those are just some critical things at high level but detailed enough where the guys, if players would get serious and really attack it, they need to attack the facts. Not just talk that something is wrong because you think it's wrong. Know it's wrong. Yeah, and you started Invictus Partners, I think a little bit because of this, a little bit of a player development plan. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, Invictus Partners, you know, it's a small boutique firm. I work with multinationals, governments, and helping them bring infrastructure and financing to their projects, infrastructure being power generation, roads, uh, refineries, industrial facilities, warehouses, port, retail, um, partner, well, not, well, in the process, of finishing a fund with Canna Fitzgerald, which is the largest private 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 investment bank in the world, and what we're doing is a equity fund that would be looking for opportunities abroad, um, working with again multinationals in different sectors, oil and gas, uh, probably being the strongest in construction, and. Um, some telecom and technology stuff as well. Yeah. All right. Um, so what do you think can be done? Is there anything that can be done, or do you think the NFL has just become so big that nothing can be done about it now? Well, yeah, things can be done. You know, he, he, we have to really – first of all, everyone – I'll tell you to the science how well our union and the league – understands where the players are in their ability of making change. Last year I was at a, a NFL retired players meeting, and they knew that the guys that would be voting on the next CBA are juniors in high school right now. Yeah. Okay? So when you're thinking that if they're thinking that far ahead, that means that right now we should – be addressing the issues that we want to address in five, six years. Let's address them now. Let's table them now. Let's do the due diligence now so that we can make sure that when it's time to present that we have already exhausted the knowledge that's required so that we can make an argument and make a better deal. And in that period of process, I believe that we have to take, we have to be able to get between now and the next CBA where the active players and the retired players are in the same room understanding that you're all, everyone is in the same boat. It doesn't matter that you active today. Tomorrow you will be a retired player, and today you have a say, but when you come over here, you won't be able to say anything about what's going on over there. So for us to be able to give them the history, give them the knowledge, and have them understand how the bylaws and how the structure of the organization keeps us in the dark. The NFLPA, the way it operates, if there are 50 issues for players to decide on, the players may only see 10 of them. 
the other 40 are being decided by administrators that really aren't looking at the best interest for the players. They're looking at the best deal that keeps the NFLPA with a slush fund so that that money keeps coming to keep them to keep those people employed so that they can continue to get those salaries that, you know, really aren't warranted. Yeah, you know? I mean, we'll, go ahead, Matt. No, um, I was just going to ask, you know, how, how do you raise awareness to these players to, you know, to, I'm like sorry, said, to get everybody up. in the same room? How, how do you what? Raise awareness to the players to, like you said, to get the former players and the current players in the same room to let everybody know that, you know, like you said, they're every, that you guys are all in the same boat. How, how do you go? How do you go about getting more awareness out uh, for the players well, to be on board with that? Well, I don't think it's a matter. All the players have. There hasn't been any players ever saying they don't want to talk a deal between active and former players. That is only happening in the administrative office of the NFLPA. The NFL has taken their hand off and told the NFLPA, that's y'all issue. We're going to give you these funds and y'all figure out what you're going to do with it. But they really hadn't given us anything. That's the problem. Right. Those things that they have, I guess you would say, shared with us, are minuscule to what they should be. What the players have to do is take control of the communication where it can't be filtered by the NFLPA so that when guys are sharing information, I'll come in and I'll say something, they'll run to the NFLPA to see if that's true. The NFLPA, if it goes against the grain or goes against the program, which is to keep it in the status quo, then that guy is crazy. They use a philosophy of saying that one player, you know, can voice an opinion, but it takes the group. So, like, if you have the rep for one team, he's going to speak for that group. So if he's not saying it, then it's discounted. Well, that group that they're talking about are the ones that are being offered the little sweetheart deals, getting invited on the trips, getting to participate in the things, getting to use the trust, which is supposed to be $100 million set aside for the players, which is a great thing. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some things that are good, but that is not enough, (laughs) you know. And I'm not saying that every player – that is involved in this process is doing things to the detriment of other players, I'm saying that they're operating in the dark and with a lack of knowledge of how they're being used as pawns to keep the other players down. Because here, as an example, they have what's called a trust. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. Okay, the trust will pay for a player to go back to school, get a vocational. I've used it to go to uh, theology school, or you can go back to college to get your degree. Great thing. But then on the other hand, I see the trust moving around, and they're having these mixers, but in these mixers, they're just parties. When they're moving around with those mixers is when we should be as players talking to each other and really using that trust as a platform to truly get to the other players, and share the information. But guys, you know, they decided, hey, we're going to just have mixes and let people know about the trust. Well, when we're there, there's no one there but the hired players from the NFLPA that's now, you know, I guess you say promoting the trust. That's some of the times that we could sit down and really have meetings versus, you know, just drinking and, you know, shooting the bull, <laughs> You know, I came in the one for 10, 15 minutes, seeing what was going on. I was like, waste of time. For me, not for them, those that, you know, want to still be Mr. Athlete and want to still be on stage or in the light, you know, perfect for you. But for what it's there for, that's squandering the opportunity. If there's $100 million, why don't we take a million of that 
and let's go hire some independent attorneys that don't have the NFL influence or the NFL PA influence just to break down the agreement and use two or three firms so that you can make sure you're getting consistent information and no one is swaying your decision or your idea of what's what. Take some of the resources and let's get that those agreements broke down. Let's do an audit of seeing how much money is being paid to the administrators and how much money is going to the players. You know, let's do a real audit on the things that are of real concerns so that the health benefits and the things that players really need are getting to them. You know, the one thing, being a guy that had a license, this is another thing. When I had that license, I was a part of the Sporting Goods Manufacturing Association. And the Sporting Goods Manufacturing Association actually keeps tab of all materials being sold through all retail. So during that time, the starter jackets were, this is before Pro-Line, the starter jackets was the key jacket being sold with all NFL stuff, and Salem was doing the T-shirts and all that. So you could see exactly what revenue was being generated from NFL merchandise. And while we were negotiating the Reggie White settlement, the league was reporting to the players that there was only about a, a little bit more than a billion, a billion two, or something like that, in revenue generated from the licensing, but the sporting goods manufacturing was to, was reporting that it was four billion <laughs> that huh. was being generated just from NFL licensed material. But when they negotiated the Reggie White settlement, they shared it on the basis of designated revenue. So the league designated the revenue that they were going to share and then shorted how much they reported. Now, those are the things that, you know, <laughs> that guys don't want to talk about. But then also, I'm one of the few, I'm the only player that was looking at that information. I had to show it to Howard Long, show it to Ronnie Lott, show it to Cornelius Bennett, Roy Woodson, you know. And, and here's another thing. Before they signed that agreement, and I won't put this gentleman out there because I don't know what streams the NFL has on. We know the NFL is an institution that got reached beyond what any of us could ever think. Just by the way they manipulate Minnesota's federal courts, you can see that. Yeah. But we had, that was a guy that was employed by the NFL at the very time that came to myself, Ronnie Lott, Howie Long, and a couple other players and told us that Gene was about to sign an agreement that would keep people, keep any other organization from being able to represent players in anything. So they were going to sign away under a global agreement our rights. And we were told that by NFL execs. <laughs> and he told us right then, what y'all need to do right now is go out there and establish another company, and grandfathered it before they put this in place, and we did it. It was called the Hitters Club. That's where the Hitters Club came from after the quarterback club. Yeah. <laughs> and that came from an NFL guy telling us of the bad deal that was being struck on us and gave us instructions how to make sure we could have a way of protecting the players. But – I'm one of the few players that's bold enough to tell you what happened. Well, see, I mean, the okay. big difference here is this, the Major League Baseball and the NFL, the big difference is Marvin Miller was there to look out for the baseball players. It sounds to me like from everything I've heard from more than just you, Gene Upshaw was out to get himself rich. I, I would tell you, Gene, you know, I hope he's in heaven, but I would tell you if it was based on – what he did, you might not see. <laughs> and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but, you know, he did that. He but, did. Hey, um, we're almost out of time. You want to tell everybody about where they can find out about your business, Invictus Partners? Where it's Invictus Partners, you know, my website is InvictusPartners.com. Um 
do a level of capital raise, and, you know, if anyone's check out the website, contact information there. If you need any of those services, give us a call. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really promote most of my business at this point is word of mouth. I've been doing this yeah. over 20, 25 years. I was a partner in a consulting firm while I was playing. So really not just promoting just to get everybody to come through the door. Yeah. All right, Matt, you got anything for Jerry? Well, Jerry, it was an honor to have you on tonight. Um, I appreciate you sharing uh, your story. Like you said, you know, not a lot of people will be willing to to share the things that you know. I appreciate you sharing that uh, with our listeners and uh, wish you the very best in your business and all of your ventures. Thank you, sir. And when are you guys going to run it? Um, it will be on probably within a half hour after we get off here. Okay. And we will share it to your page. All right. And you gonna if put you notice, we share everything all over the place. So. <laughs> well, I definitely I pick you up on the page on on Facebook, but yeah. you know I appreciate the opportunity and um, hey, you know if there's any other thing I can do, uh, any other player you want to talk to, I might be able to point you to some interesting commentary. Okay, I got your number here. You mind that. me giving you a call sometime? No problem. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, Jerry. I want to remind everybody you can catch us on thegrillingtruth.net. You can catch us on Google Music, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, just about any any place that carries podcasts. Um, follow us at Grueling Truth. Uh, Matt, any final words? I uh, just you know it, it just goes to show you know more and more players uh, have said a lot of the same things, and you know it's gonna, it's going to take a lot to get things turned around but it starts with first just spreading awareness and you know, I'd just like to see I'd really like to see former players get representation that they deserve. Yeah and I mean it's the problem is it's a big corporation and like any right. billion dollar corporation in this country or anywhere in the world they pretty much get to do whatever they want because you know the governments and everything just turn their blind eye to it and everything and they're just worried about I mean, come on, they were a 501C for how many years until the last year or so? So, I mean, right. that'll tell you right there that they had pretty much everything. I think they got the 501C back in, like, the mid-60s or so. so yeah, yeah. I mean, they well, didn't they, have, yeah, it, it's unreal. Yep, but, they say the value of the league is at $62 billion or more now. Wow. Yeah. And, and the, <laughs> the fact that they can't take care of – the Roman Gabriels, the Eddie Metters, I mean, the guys that built that empire for them, it would not hurt them right. at all to take care of those guys. Just take care of the not, players. Not at all. Not at all. And, and it's, it's just it's sickening. And, and I'll tell you, the more that we've done this, we've probably interviewed 100 to 150 players in the last year. And just the stories we hear – and I mean, and, and then it's just like the other day, I'm not going to say who the player was, but it was a quarterback back in the 60s and 70s that I really wanted to interview. I actually got through to somebody that knew him, and he's like, he can't do it. I mean, he's been deteriorating for years. I mean, yeah. Is the NFL helping? No. He's got a pension of $1,200 a month. Right. right. I mean, exactly. it's a joke. It's a joke. And, I mean, they're going to make – I mean, they've turned the NFL draft into making millions of dollars for themselves, or billions of dollars even. The freaking draft. They could just well, we, use the NFL draft, the money that they could get from that, to help the players. Just yeah. the draft. Well, we appreciate you guys and what you're doing. You know, please help us keep getting that message out because it's needed. And it might not benefit us today, but it will help those guys in the future. And they just had the information. Well, most definitely. I appreciate the kind words. And like I said, I'll call you here in a little bit and All right. we'll see Have what we can night. do there. But thanks a lot, Jerry. So for uh, Jerry Ball, Matt Andrews Scavage, I'm Mike Goodpasser. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.